Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Ken Hayes, Philip Shane, and Paul Boyer. Coming up on DTNS, Europe makes USB-C the law. Uber Eats takes on Goldbelly for shipping food across the continent. And Dr. Nikki Ackermans tells us about the tech needed to slice up muskox brains for science. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, June 7th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Joining us, our science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackervins. Welcome back, Nikki. Hello. Thanks for having me back. Thank you for bringing your headbutting knowledge uh, of both technology <laughs> and literal heads to our show. My pleasure. <laughs> uh, let's start with a few tech things you should know. Bleepian Computer reports that the city of Palermo, which is in Italy's Sicily, has been shut down for three days due to what may be a ransomware attack. Palermo's Councillor for Innovation said all systems were shut down and isolated from the network, which is behavior consistent with combating ransomware. In the meantime, all of Palermo's services, that includes its police, can only be reached by phone or fax. Tourists can't access online bookings for museums or theaters or up other public venues, and no one can acquire traffic zone cards for restricted areas like the city center. Kind of a kind of a kind of a cluster. Yeah. So they all sat down and had an ombra divino or something. I'm sure it'll be fine. Sure. Uh, yeah. TikTok launched a new avatars feature, uh, letting users create a customized digital representation, including custom voice styles. These can be used as an overlay for a user while recording video or as a miniature avatar that can be added with reactions to a video. German drone taxi company Volocopter announced that its four-seat electric VTOL aircraft, the Voloconnect, completed its first flight in May. The initial trip was only two minutes and 14 seconds, but aerodynamics and performance held up in real-world conditions, says the company, at a 60-mile range and 155-mile-per-hour flight speed. The Volo Connect serves as a companion to the Volo City. You might remember that is a shorter ranged EVTOL flyer meant for urban areas. The Volo Connect expects to serve customers starting in 2026, two years after the Volo City's projected 2024 rollout. eBay launched something called eBay Vault, which is a service that'll store your valuable trading cards to enable faster and secure selling. Cards valued at more than $750 can be stored in eBay's 31,000 square foot Delaware facility. Cards are going to be graded and verified by the PSA service upon arrival. So you get high quality grading, high quality storage, and the cards can be left in the vault even after you buy them for safekeeping. eBay plans to add a processing fee for the service, but not until early next year. Uh, we covered WWDC with Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines uh, of the Snob OS podcast, but here's a roundup of some Apple announcements that didn't make it uh, into the keynote but are notable. Rapid security responses will allow some security patches on iPhone, iPad, and Mac to be applied without a reboot iOS 16 will support Face ID in landscape mode on iPhone 13S. iOS 16 will also let users view their Wi-Fi passwords and settings. And we'll also support Nintendo Switch Pro and Joy-Con controllers. TVOS will support those controllers as well. So if you're looking for something besides that remote, you got some other options. Mac OS Ventura will also ask for user permission before sending data to connected USB and Thunderbolt accessories. All right. Uh, big waves being made by the EU. What do we got here, Sarah? All right. So EU lawmakers have reached an agreement on an amendment to the Radio Equipment Directive. If you need a little refresher or you haven't heard of it, the directive will apply to 15 categories of electronics, including smartphones, laptops, digital cameras, headphones, handheld video game consoles, e-readers and tablets, kind of all the hardware. So what are the details, Tom? Yeah, so devices in 14 of those categories, we're going to leave out laptops for the moment, but for the rest of the categories, if they are rechargeable via a wired cable, that's in the law or will be, uh, they will have to have a USB-C charging port if they want to be brought to market in the EU two years after the amendment goes into effect. So the amendment goes into effect two years from that moment, 
everything has to have a USB-C port in it for charging. Uh, that likely would happen sometime in 2024. Laptops get a longer deadline. They have three years and four months before all the laptops marketed in Europe have to have USB-C. The extra time for laptops is there to agree on the definitions for laptop chargers above 100 watts. Between 100 and 240 watts is covered by USB-C 2.1, but cables supporting the higher charging levels are just now hitting the market, so they're giving a little extra time for that. The directive will not apply to products brought to market before the deadline, so you're not going to see them like sweeping the shelves clean of lightning port iPhones, for example, uh, device makers also must market their devices both with and without chargers in the box. You can't have just one or the other. You have to give folks the option. And we can already hear your wheels turning on ways companies might try to get around these rules, right? Yeah. So it's possible the companies might just do away with a wired charging port altogether saying we don't want to do this. So <laughs> that's how we get around this. And the directive accounts for that possibility as well. The commission will ask standards bodies to create a standard for wireless charging interoperability that will then become a requirement. One criticism of this directive is that it might deter the development of new and better charging standards. I mean, that's what we're all looking for, right? Commissioner for the EU's internal market, Terry Breton said, quote, we have a dedicated team that will help, that will keep a close eye on all of this and adapt as time goes by, end quote. So one might say, when is this going to become law? Yeah. So as usual with these big announcements in the EU, uh, it's a provisional agreement that they're making a big deal about today. Uh, members of the European Parliament, and representatives from the European Council, which has a seat for every country, uh, have gotten together and agreed, I think we can pass this. All of our all of our people are on board. That makes it more than likely it will pass votes in both bodies and then get approved by all the member countries. If all goes to plan, this one should move pretty quickly. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of controversy around it. So it's likely to get published later this summer, which then that's why they're saying, okay, two years from later this summer would be 2024. That's why when we'll see this apply to most of the devices. Nikki, do you care if uh, your devices have to have a USB-C port or not? I like the idea from an environmental standpoint, less cables, potentially, if everyone yeah. can have just one cable for all of your things. I also tend to forget my charger all the time. So if someone had the same cable, it'd be easier. And this comes with the caveat that's like, as long as they can keep up with the modernity, say they have something in there that like refreshes the standard every year. Maybe that could keep it on track. I personally like the idea, but I could see how from a tech point of view, you'd be kind of reticent to it. Yeah, I mean, we've we've talked about this. Uh, I don't know if it was Justin Robert Young who was on the show where where the, you know, the, the idea was brought up of like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. But as technology advances and uh, laws sometimes lag behind the technology advancement. Yeah. Does this actually hurt consumers in the long run? And Tom, I know you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, I like this in principle. I like the idea that everybody has a USB-C charging port and we can interoperate. And I, th I think that's a great goal. Uh, what I worry about is the unintended consequences down the road. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that Commissioner Breton is saying, don't worry, we're going to keep an eye on it and we'll adapt the law as it goes. Uh, as we all know, laws never have a tough time keeping up with the times. Uh, uh, they're they're always passed quickly and without controversy yeah. every yeah. time they're needed. Uh, that then, of course, I'm being uh, sarcastic. That's my concern. Is that it's great that they're saying the right thing. It would have been nicer to put a mechanism in the law that maybe tied it to the standards organization. Uh, USBIF yeah. is a standards organization. If you said whatever USBIF determines, then that becomes the new thing. Would have made it a little more seamless. But even then. I have a little bit of a concern that this is going to dissuade companies from exploring new technologies that aren't part of the USB implementers forum uh, that they would have otherwise, because why bother? You can't even sell it in Europe. Uh, so I think it it provides a small break uh, on innovation uh, because of that. It is a, a small disincentivization of, of innovation. All right, let's talk food. Uber Eats has given Gold Belly some competition. Gold Belly, if you haven't heard of it, ships food from top restaurants in hundreds of locations in the United States. That includes the Pipeline Bake Shop in Honolulu. That's right. You can get it from Hawaii. You can get Barnacle Foods from Alaska. And it ships to those states, too. It doesn't just pull the food off of uh, Alaska and Hawaii. It brings it to the mainland as well. Uh, pretty much 
anywhere in the domestic U.S. Sorry, Puerto Rico and U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, but shipping is almost always free. So Uber said, that's a great business. We'd like a piece of that too, please. Uh, starting June 7th, Uber Eats customers in the U.S. are doing what, Sarah? Uh, well, yeah, so they are going after Gold Belly um, in a l more limited uh, limited scale. So Uber Eats customers starting June 7th can find options for things like bagels from the other side of the country that you might just really have a hankering for, Cuban dishes or macaroons, chimichurri sauces from popular merchants in Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, and Miami. So it is limited. If you're like, well, what about that wonderful barbecue place in St. Louis that I would like to order from? Not happening yet on Uber Eats, but again, small rollout. It also won't ship outside the mainland U.S. It only has 15 restaurants where the food is coming from in New York, Miami, and Los Angeles. Average delivery time, uh, according to Uber Eats uh, shipping program on the app, is five to seven days. So you might say, is it even going to be fresh? Spokesperson for the company says, oh, that number is closer to four to five days. But still, you know, you got to put it on ice, probably. It's also partnering with FedEx for delivery. Uber's delivery spin-out, Uber Freight, which we've talked about on the show, is not part of this. That connects shippers with carriers, separate service. Shipment tracking, again, handled by FedEx. Packing and shipping is done by the restaurants themselves. Uber Eats just provides the shipping label and a postcard with instructions. And uh, Uber Eats not the only one that wants a piece of Gold Belly's pie. Uh, DoorDash also started this business model in November last year when it launched nationwide shipping for merchants, including Carlo's Bakery and Katz's Deli, uh, which I'll be honest, the Uber Eats launch partners don't have me uh, incredibly impressed. I know it's early and they'll, they'll get more, but their one bagel shop is in Los Angeles and <laughs> the barbecue place is in Los Angeles as well. Ooh. Whereas like I've done gold belly, I've gotten Nessa bagels from New York. I've gotten Kansas city barbecue, uh, sent to me. So I, I hope Uber eats expands and does better. Uh, it's good to have competition for gold belly, but right now I don't know if this is competition for gold belly. Uh, I, I know we were we were talking before the show and Nikki, you and I were both like had not heard of Gold Belly before. No. <laughs> it's funny. A friend of mine was like, yes, you have, Sarah. I told you all <laughs> how great it was like a couple of weeks ago. Like this is a very, very common thing that people order for gifts, not just for themselves. But, you know, you want to send somebody that you love their favorite item from a restaurant that they're not going to be near anytime soon. Love the idea of this. Kind of a novelty thing, right? But love the idea of it. And I, yeah, I just, I've never used Gold Belly before. When I look at their website, I'm like, well, we have quite a few options. So Uber Eats is, sure, creeping into the market as a competitor, but on a smaller scale. Yeah, I like the idea. Um, I just don't know how I feel about like having food that's four days old. But again, maybe they're really good at it. Also, environmentally, this seems not sustainable, but that's just the biologist in me who's like, do we do we have to do it though? <laughs> Yeah, the the uh, the way Gold Belly does it, I'm sure Uber Eats is going to do something similar, but I, I don't know the details, uh, is you're using dry ice. Uh, you're packing stuff frozen. Uh, it's got dry ice in the package, okay. you know, enough that if it went a week getting there, it'd still be good. Uh, everything I've ever gotten from Gold Belly was hard frozen. Uh, it was not, it was not even partially melted by the time I get it. Uh, so, so I, that part is, is doable and and we have to wait and see if uber yeah. eats does it as well as gold belly does but it's certainly doable the the environmental impact of it as far as like you know the the transportation Shipping cost and, and the yeah. and the packaging materials most of everything was recyclable uh but even yeah. recyclable is still a loss. So I don't know that that's any worse than shipping anything else to be honest except maybe because you have to do a little dry ice but it's certainly a consideration you're right I I do love I haven't used it a lot because even though the shipping is free, the price of the food is still kind of expensive. It has but to I, be to yeah. do that. So it's not something yeah, I'm I mean, doing you, every day. You've got to yeah. cover your 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 transportation costs. But we did it for Thanksgiving. Yeah. We got Joe's barbecue from Kansas City sent to us for Thanksgiving. We did the Essa bagel during the lockdown. Uh and and back then a lot of companies, a lot of restaurants were able to survive because of 
gold belly because they were able to ship, you know, around to, to people who needed it. A um, little bit of a different well, situation we're in now. And I think that, you know, sometimes uh, freezing food gets a bad rap because you go, oh, no, freezer burn. It's going to be, you know, stale and gross by the time you reheat it. Not always the case. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has no. to be it, it has to be prepared the right way. But but freezing food can actually be the best thing for it. Yeah. Certain on. food depends on the food. Right. Um, yeah. Levain's. I don't know if you know Levain's Ooh, cookies. The best yeah, I can tell Nikki knows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not through Gold Belly, just direct from Levain's. You can have them mail you frozen cookies and then you heat those up and then it's indistinguishable. It's so yeah. I eat at least one a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, I don't know if I can eat one a day. I always have small, a I've heard of it. Yeah, definitely heard of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, folks, if you've used the DoorDash or the Gold Belly uh, system, or you're, you're going to try the Uber Eats one, uh, let us know. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. If you're thinking about solar panels these days, because you're like, you know what? I don't want to be adding to the problem. I want to be helping the problem. Uh, we have a listen for you, a solar panel roundtable. Myself, Sarah, and three guests explain the process, the things to consider, what you can expect to spend and save coming to this feed this Saturday. So look for it, share with your friends. And if you want it sooner, you can Let's do it right now. Just become a patron. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Recently, Dr. Nikki published a paper in the journal Acta Neuropathologica called Evidence of Traumatic Brain Injury in Headbutting Bovids. Uh, it turns out that headbutting musk oxen and bighorn sheep aren't as resistant to trauma, maybe as you thought. But to get the data she needed for the research, Nikki relied on two bits of technology, MRI and fluorescence microscopy. But let's start with why you wanted to research this, Nikki, and, and, what, and what did you find? Uh, sure. And I'm so excited to talk about it. The reason we wanted to research it is because traumatic brain injury and CTE are huge issues for humans, uh, and we mm -hmm. don't really have a good way of addressing them. We know the person gets injury then it's a black box and then they pass away and we can look at their brains and sort of the middle part is really blurry. So we need models to try and understand how this develops. So the idea was to go to animals who did the most extreme form of headbutting in the world. So bighorn sheep and musk oxen and try and figure out if they're protecting their brains, if they're not, how are they not dead? Um, so that's what we did. <laughs> so the idea being like, we, we can learn a lot by looking at animals these are some animals that seem to be okay. <laughs> you know, they're, they're walking around after doing this. Yeah. Maybe it'll teach us something. And what you found was like, well, they're not as okay as we, as we thought, huh? Yeah, the opposite, actually. <laughs> um, and I'll go into how the tech worked out with that. So as you would do in a human, if you suspect someone has some brain injury, you send them through an MRI machine. Uh, MRI is basically magnetic resonance imaging. So it looks at the soft tissue in your body and in the case of a brain and the image that we have up there is a muskox brain, not a human brain. It's probably the only muskox MRI you're going to see for a while. Um, basically, you can see if you have trauma. And the way that this works is that this machine has giant magnets in the tube that you're laying in and it creates a really strong magnetic field. And this forces the protons in your cells to align. And then it sends a radio frequency current through um, your body and it causes these protons to misalign and spin around and they release energy. Mm. So uh, basically the sensors in the machine pick this up and then can make an image out of this because different organs in your body have different densities. They have different sort of proton energy emissions and then you get this image um, on there. And the, to link this to our musk oxen, when we sent the brain through, we didn't see anything. And that's actually what we would expect because in a human, if you send them through an MRI, if you see something, so you would see like brain bleeding, a tissue tearing or brain shrinkage, they're already really far advanced in, you know, TBI, CTE or Alzheimer's. So it showed at least that these guys didn't have, you know, super advanced disease. Go ahead. So, so, so you, you, you send them through the MRI, the, the, these are skulls, I assume, right? Uh, just the brains. We took the brains out. Or just the, the brains. The skulls are massive. So okay. we thought the bone might interfere with the mm -hmm. uh, MRI. Mm -hmm. so. All right. So mm -hmm. you, you pop a brain out of a musk ox, yeah. uh, you send it through the MRI. Uh, it looks normal. So mm -hmm. then you, what do you move on to then? So because of that, we wanted to move on to the cellular level. So in humans, you'll usually see a sort of pattern 
of some dying neurons in specific patterns. It's different for Alzheimer's than it is for CTE. CTE is basically chronic traumatic brain injury. So sort of small, milder concussions over time leads to this disease that can mm -hmm. later lead to, to Alzheimer's. And so to look at them on the cellular scale, we basically slice them up in a like a mini deli slicer. That's not so technology. <laughs> it's just vibrating and it's, it's a deli slicer. Um, and, so it's an uh, actual deli slicer? I mean, some people use a real deli slicer. It's called a vibratome, but it's just a razor blade that vibrates and so cuts. So it's no like different than okay, yeah, yeah. Thin. Gotcha. But mm -hmm. I have seen people use a real deli slicer. <laughs> nice, interesting. For whale brains. <laughs> um, anyway, um, when we get them really thin like this on the slicer, we can start to see through them on the microscope. But to stain the specific cells and proteins and things that we want to look at that can indicate that there might be trauma, we have to sort of stain them. And one of the ways to look at them is by staining them with fluorescent molecules and fluorescent. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, there you go. That's one of the pictures. So, oh, yeah, that's not very descriptive for audio listeners. But basically, you can stain different cells, different colors using these fluorescent molecules. So what happens is you have a fluorescent microscope. And these days you can buy specific lasers that are very expensive and you attach them to your microscope and they'll emit specific wavelengths and they'll excite these molecules at different wavelengths. And the way that you, when you sort of incubate them and you're doing your experiment, you can choose the wavelength. So let's say we want something to fluoresce in red and we choose the wavelength 495. Um, and then when you shine the laser on it, that specific thing that you saying will come out in red. Hmm. Um, and the cool thing about being able to do multiple wavelengths is that you can add different colors. So you can do red, green, and blue. If I wanted to look at how a certain protein is interacting with a certain cell type, you can look at them both at the same time with two different colors. Um, and you can't do this with traditional microscopy. Mm -hmm. And this is really cool for something like TBI because actually when there is a brain trauma, you'll have neurons start to die off um, and show certain types of protein that you can stain that. And you have other cells called um, glial cells. They kind of clean up and mm -hmm. they'll start to activate and clump around these neurons. And so if you can see them both together, this is like a really good sign for us and a bad sign for the person <laughs> or the muskox that there's been sort of a chronic brain trauma. And I mean, for the what comes to mind, Nikki, to me is, I mean, certainly in professional football, uh, certainly yeah. professional boxing, even if you aren't professional, but you're playing a lot of these combat sports and you're getting, you know, repeated um, trauma to the head. Are, you know, are any of these organizations interested in this kind of research? Do, you know, is that, is that something that, you know, they, they're going to get something out of? Uh, so, of course, they're interested in the prevention research. Um, like when this big news came out around 2015, the NFL dumped a ton of money into concussion research because they kind of got caught red handed. Um, yeah. But so right now, we don't know very well how to look at it while the people are still alive. So. I'm sort of trying to establish a model of animals who develop naturally. That's basically what we found is that they do give themselves brain trauma, just enough that they don't die. And so if we can try and study animals like domestic sheep, so like smaller headbutting animals, not only musk oxen, um, and try to learn how these diseases develop in their brains, we can hopefully try and understand better how it works in human brains. There's a lot of steps in between, but that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. This is a uh, fascinating technology. Uh, hopefully on, on the expanded show, we, we can talk about the pendulum that you were telling me about uh, oh, yes. when we met in Las Vegas, which is not related to this particular study, right? It's, it's for a different a cousin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a related thing. Uh, but thanks for, thanks for sharing this uh, with us. And we'll have links to the, the article itself, as well as some other write-ups on it uh, in the show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com. Indeed, we will. And keeping on the science train, this is a cool one. A patient born with microtia in the right ear has been surgically fitted with a 3D printed implant made of the patient's own cells. The company behind the technique, uh, 3D Bio, which is an, in an ongoing clinical trial, says of the procedure, quote, we believe this is the first time that a company has printed a whole living engineered construct and implanted it into a patient to replace a body part that the patient was either born without or lost due to trauma or disease, end quote. This new method of ear reconstruction could help microtia treatment. That's quite a bit easier than what our current procedures, which include surgery, invasive techniques like harvesting rib cartilage to build back that organ. So pretty cool. Yeah. 
it's it's printing cart- cartilage, which is a living material. A little bit of a sheet, cheat, I guess, because cartilage is less living than like a liver. Uh, but it's still technically living material uh, that can divide and, and, and everything. And the pictures on the CNET article are, are impressive where you see the person missing the cartilage and their ear is, isn't formed properly. And then once the implant is in there, it looks like like a, a, a the kind of ear you would expect yeah. to see and, and a, yeah, per, a good working order. Yeah, drastically different. I, I would say improved <laughs> because it depends on what kind of ear you want. But yeah, it, it's uh, it probably seems, improved uh, the hearing, right? Because it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is which is usually uh, you know, what the number one thing that you care about. I wonder about things like blood vessels and the different like hearing tubes and how that all connects up. Of course, this is already a pretty big innovation, but cool. Yeah. But also, hmm, <laughs> how can we go further? Right. It's it. It's one of those where I know a lot of outlets that publish this overstated it, like first living material printed. And people are like, wait, I thought they printed livers. Like, well, they print part of livers. This, yeah. this is like, you know, full on chondrocytes. Full, yeah. Doing it's good cartilage. for aesthetics too. An organ. Like to be able to have an ear. And then yeah. I'm like, how come we're not good at 3D printing meat? Because like we can make an ear. So. <laughs> well, and, and one of the things with meat is having the scaffolding properly to get the texture. And if you can print some cartilage for it to there grow around, <laughs> then yeah, maybe there's a, a combination to be had here. That's uh, that's good stuff. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got a real nice email from Jeremy who wrote in saying, I've debated on buying some of Len's art. He's talking about Len Peralta from the show before. Never pulled the trigger. But on Friday, uh, that was June 3rd, DTNS. Jeremy says, I had to, both digital and physical. My grandma was a Rosie. Now, if you're like, what? What is this? Uh, Len, you, you got you to gotta see what he drew on Friday. It was a Rosie the Riveter uh, kind of derivative. Uh, Jeremy says, uh, my grandmother worked in a GM body plant. After leaving there, she became a teaching assistant where her students nicknamed her Ms. Rosie after the character on the posters. Thank you for bringing back some great memories. Oh, thank you, Jeremy. That's great. Uh, yeah, go yeah. check out uh, LenPeraltaStore.com. You can you can find the uh, the art there. I'm sure you'll notice the the Rosie the Riveter looking one with the the red bandana on. Can't miss it. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I mean, Len always does good stuff, but uh, mm. I, I feel like Friday resonated with some folks. So thank you for letting us know. Jeremy. Yeah, we did get a, a, a little bit more uh, positivity around it than, than normal. There's always some, like you said. Uh, and then Scott uh, was listening to our conversation yesterday about the sleep tracking announcements related to iOS 16 and watch OS 9 uh, and said, I just wanted to mention that the Aura Ring and app do exactly what you were talking about when you were talking about nap tracking. Uh, Terrence and I were, were joking about, we we need something that just tracks you while you're taking a nap because uh, we want to take off our watch while we sleep. Uh, and not only Scott, uh, but uh, uh, Josh also uh, wrote in and said that the Aura Ring do that. Scott said, it identifies when you appear to be resting or napping. Uh, you can then confirm the activity if accurate, and it updates your daily stats appropriately. So uh, thank you both, Josh and uh, and Scott, for pointing that out. Maybe, another reason to maybe get an Aura Ring now, huh? Yeah, I know some Aura Ring uh, faithful out there who say this is just the best way. It's better than, you know, if you don't like something on your wrist, you know, wear, wear, a, uh, wear a ring on your finger. But, you know, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Uh, thank you to Dr. Nikki Ackerman for being with us today. Nikki, I don't know if you do any sleep tracking, but I know you're busy. So let folks know where they can keep up with what you do. Yeah, um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So people can follow my science there at Ackerman's Nicole. If not, my website uh, is at NicoleAckermans.com. So uh, knock yourself out. <laughs> Well, thank you but, so much for being on the show. But Good don't literally amazing. knock yourself don't, out, don't, or then you'll have to right. use the results of Nikki's research to. Nikki yeah. will slice your brain up with a <laughs> deli meat. I will slice her. <laughs> no, it's just, <laughs> just, just know that ahead of time. Also, we have a brand new boss to thank. That new boss's name is Stephen. Stephen just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. You are our, our. There our, it is. You know. <laughs> You've won Eurovision of our show. Really? Today. Really, you did. And uh, who will it be tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet, where we expand lots of topics we talk about on DTNS and veer into others. Available at patreon.com slash DTNS. We roll into it right after we wrap up here. Just a reminder, we are live on the show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. 
Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back doing it again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Rockman Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>